introduce to you Alec McKenzie, who is uh, uh, interested in, uh, in our position uh, here at the University of Toronto on the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education. Uh, this is a tenure stream position in exercise physiology. The, uh, the focus of this particular position is on the interactions of exercise and, and physical activity and nutrition. Uh, also, an interest in competence in supporting high performance athletes would be desirable. Excellence in research is required, demonstrated through publications in a research pipeline that is at a high international level. <clears throat> the uh, candidate will be expected to, to develop an original, innovative, and independently funded research program and a, uh, have a commitment to excellent teaching and student mentorship in the undergraduate and graduate programs. Please welcome Alex. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here, uh, for, for allowing me to speak here. I'm really excited to share uh, my research experiences, and I hope you find it interesting. Um, the title of this presentation is The Restoration of Skeletal Muscle Health and Function for the Promotion of Healthy Aging. Um, one of the reasons I decided to tailor this, this presentation in this manner is because I understand the University of Toronto places great emphasis on exercise, the importance of exercise, and exercise research. Um, and while I certainly appreciate that, uh, a lot of my graduate studies have focused on uh, how deleterious the absence of exercise can be, especially for older people. Uh, and so I'd just like to share and highlight some of uh, my uh, major findings. The presentation outline will, uh, is uh, fairly general. I'll go through my background, um, touch on my graduate research experience. Um, I'll touch a little bit on my teaching experience and teaching uh, uh, topics of interest in teaching, and then uh, I'll close with remarks and uh, acknowledgments, and feel free to ask questions at that time. So, I'm originally from Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, which many of you might recognize from your history textbooks. I grew up outside, mountain, mountain biking, playing soccer, um, so I really enjoyed my time at Utah. I get to do a lot of that. Another interesting thing about me is I performed in the Colonial Williamsburg Fife and Drum Corps. I'm sure, I'm sure all of you have seen uh, photos of the Fife and Drum Corps, and you're, you're understanding very well. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> there's us performing in the 2008 Macy's Day Parade, and I was standing right here. <laughs> um, so, if you have any questions regarding exercise physiology or 18th century field music, uh, you can feel free to ask me those later, too. Uh, I did my undergraduate and master's studies at James Madison University. I really enjoyed my time there. It's a fantastic institution, great people, great mentors. Um, it was my first introduction to science and muscle biology, exercise physiology. Uh, while I was there, my last year, I completed a very large undergraduate internship in the Department of Kinesiology's Human Performance Laboratory. Uh, mostly what we studied there uh, was exercise training and nutritional strategies to maximize aerobic cycling performance. Um, we, focused on cycling for a number of reasons, um, but uh, most of the nutritional strategies we employed in involved uh, supplemental protein or like chocolate milk after exercise. That, that, those are the primary research avenues of my primary mentors, uh, Dr. Saunders and Dr. Luton. Um, we also had an, uh, uh, an opportunity while working in that lab to do performance testing on some professional cyclists that would come through and want uh, sort of like early season results uh, and they'd compare it to previous seasons and uh, ask us for advice on how they can tailor their training. So that, that was really exciting for me there. Uh, what, I, uh, what I studied at the University of Utah was pretty much the exact opposite of what I did at James Madison University. Um, while working on my PhD, I worked as a graduate research assistant in uh, Dr. Micah Drummond's Muscle Biology Laboratory. And there, we studied the role of inactivity-induced inflammation in the development of muscle and metabolic dysfunction during inactivity. Um, and in particular, we, we studied this phenomenon in the context of older adults. Um, and just very recently, uh, sort of a new area of research that we pursued was uh, developing targeted therapies to prevent muscle loss and the insulin resistance that uh, can develop quite rapidly during a period of inactivity. 
So uh, the premise for my graduate research is that as we age, there is a general decline in our in our health or physical function, uh, metabolic performance, um, and this sort of inevitable decline is punctuated by uh, periods of inactivity. So you can you can define these periods of inactivity as um, an injury, uh, some sort of surgery uh, that, that might happen, uh, but they can be as little as the, the weather being really bad and you don't leave your house for a couple of days and, and you, you're not very active for a period of time because maybe you're ill. Um, but these repeated cycles of inactivity, especially as you get older, um, are uh, really contribute to muscle loss uh, and metabolic dysfunction, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. But um, what's also unfortunate about these is there's, there seems to be a pattern of impaired recovery. And so these cycles are thought to lead to the development of sarcopenia, which is the age-related loss in muscle mass. Um, and this loss in muscle mass, and uh, also to a function, uh, is really thought to lead to a decrease in physical independence and also contribute to um, more chronic disorders like diabetes and decreased health span. So interventions need to be put in place to avoid these periods of inactivity altogether uh, or shorten these periods of inactivity, uh, maybe interfere with uh, what's causing the muscle to be lost or interfere with the metabolic function that's uh, occurring or uh, accelerate the recovery from these periods of inactivity. Uh, one study that I worked on, like right when I got uh, to the University of Utah, was this really interesting. I'm sorry, uh, this really interesting hip fracture study, where um, older adults were recruited uh, within a, a certain, a, a short time after a surgical repair of a, a hip fracture surgery, um, and they were biopsied right after their uh, hip had been surgically repaired. Uh, then they were biopsied again 12 weeks after uh, a resistance training-based program. Um, so the idea here is that uh, this resistance exercise training should improve the muscle health of these individuals that have uh, suffered this uh, pretty severe trauma. Um, these are really difficult biopsies to do. Uh, these people have really small uh, quadricep muscles, that's where we did it. Um, and so I really commend Dr. Drummond for getting this many subjects in this study in the first place. This is, this is tough to do. Um, but what we found is that, uh, I'm sorry again for these, these figures too, or viewer made us do it like this. but. Um, the dotted line here uh, represents the pre-level, so immediately after uh, surgical repair of a hip fracture, and these bars are their uh, responses to the exercise training. And fortunately, there were uh, uh, responses in gene expression associated with inflammation, and uh, some of these genes here involved in uh, your innate immune system, or the immune system in, in your muscle cells themselves. Um, that are, are thought to contribute to muscle loss. And uh, fortunately, the exercise training program reduced uh, the expression of, of a lot of these genes that have shown to impair muscle function. Um, but at the same time, these individuals experienced uh, an improvement in their quadricep muscle size, uh, their muscle strength, and some of their uh, functional outcomes, like the six minute walk test, which is just how far can you walk in six minutes? And in those three areas, they significantly improve their performance. Uh, and also, interestingly enough, these three variables also strongly correlated with, uh, or negatively correlated with a lot of these genes associated with inflammation and um, immune signaling. Um, so, slightly different approach, uh, not exercise itself, but like uh, an exercise analog. In this study, uh, we had older adults uh, use neuromuscular electrical stimulation and uh, routine protein supplementation during five days of bed rest in the efforts uh, that this sort of hammer approach to protecting muscle would adequ adequately protect their uh, muscle function and muscle size, metabolic function falling five days of bed rest. And what we found is where the cuff was, where the NMES cuff was on their thigh, they uh, did not experience any lean tissue mass loss when measured by DEXA, which is really cool. Um, unfortunately, that was about the only positive thing we saw in the trial. And, um, in the bigger picture, not, not not as helpful as we would like because these, these people, even though they got this treatment, uh, they still had the same uh, loss in leg strength and leg power. Um, in this study, we also did muscle biopsies and uh, we didn't see any myofiber size protection either. So the individual muscle fibers in, in the quadricep muscles that are 
um, contracting, responsible for moving people around, uh, using glucose, those are also smaller uh, in our intervention trial. So uh, the takeaway from here is that there needs to be more, uh, a more potent intervention that needs to be implemented to sort of protect the muscle health and metabolic function during people, uh, for people during bed rest. Um, it's also possible that just an isometric uh, application of this uh, NMES de device isn't adequate. You, you need to do a full range of motion type things, more weight bearing things to protect the, the muscle of people during bed rest. Um, so I mentioned this a little bit, but uh, I'll get into some of the metabolic dysfunction that we also observe during uh, bed rest. In this figure, this is the results of an uh, oral glucose tolerance test. So people would consume a glucola drink. I haven't had one, but I've heard they taste terrible. Um, and we measure their uh, blood glucose every 30 minutes for two hours. Um, so the dotted line up here uh, indicates that after bed rest, they had a much greater glucose excursion than they did before bed rest, and including in, uh, indicating some glucose intolerance. This is also reflected here in uh, their insulin that was measured during the glucose tolerance test, showing that there, there's also some insulin resistance that's developed. And, and this is just five days of bed rest. This, is, this isn't a very long time. Um, so some of the mechanisms that we think are involved based on our previous research is muscle inflammation. That, that, that seems to be a big one. Um, but a new one that we've really started to investigate are these, is the stem cell content in skeletal muscle. So uh, in every tissue in your body, you have stem cells. They're responsible for regenerating damaged or uh, old tissue. Skeletal muscle has stem cells as well. Um, and older people have been shown to have less stem cell content, but after five days of bed rest, they have way less stem cell content. So this, we, we see this as a big problem for older adults that want to recover and um, sort of return to the healthy baseline that they were at before. So what we need here are, what, what we believe uh, is, is needed here are interventions that can target uh, muscle inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, and maybe some stem cell content while you're at it. Um, one intervention that has uh, emerged recently is the possibility of using metformin. Uh, so metformin is a drug that's typically prescribed to diabetics to improve their uh, glycemic function. It lowers blood sugar uh, quite adequately. It's, it's done so very safely and very well for uh, close to 50 years now. Um, it's pretty cheap, widely available, really well tolerated. Um, but also, uh, and uh, very recently, people have noticed that metformin seems to have a sort of anti-aging uh, property and that people keep being given metformin have lower rates of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's disease. So as aging is defined now, it, you, you can't get medicine because you're old. It's not necessarily a disease, but older people do experience uh, greater incidences of sicknesses. So if there is, if there's some sort of treatment that you can give to people that would alleviate these and, and maybe begin to classify or, or think of aging as a problem that you can treat, then uh, th this could really improve health spans for individuals. So we were interested in using met, uh, metformin as a therapy to prevent some of the negative consequences that are associated with inactivity. Um, and before we tried it in humans, we, and there, there's another group that had similar results, uh, we had mice. <coughs> immobilized their legs, uh, well, we immobilized their legs for eight days. Um, and then, and some of the mice, they, weren't, they were just given uh, saline treatment and then some of the mice were given uh, metformin in their water. So they were, they were just freely drinking this. Um, and after eight days, uh, the results weren't so clear in the plantaris muscle, but in the soleus muscle, uh, the metformin seemed to have uh, some, a, a promising effect in, in protecting the muscle loss in this muscle. So it's not to the level of the controls, but if these were clinical data, this would be pretty impressive and, and the results are pretty clear. I highlight the soleus muscle in mouse because um, its fiber or its, its muscle composition is much more similar to a human's uh, in that regard. So we, we believe that this, this could be promising in a human trial. So in, uh, for my dissertation project, we, uh, our current, or this, it was a metformin clinical trial. Um, and given that there is muscle loss and metabolic dysfunction that occurred during uh, a period of bed rest, um, and these mechanisms aren't very well understood, we thought that metformin could be um, 
uh, a really good strategy or a good starting point to try and see if we can interfere with um, some of these negative consequences. There's, I'm, I'm sure there's probably better drugs, there's, there's something that we've um, developed that is uh, much more specific and better, but metformin's been around for 50 years, there's, no, there's really no need to go back and redo the safety trials, there's no, you don't need to put money into, uh, in, in, into the, that, that side of it. Um, so these questions have never been addressed in young or old people uh, that, that, that using metformin to prevent the loss of muscle and metabolic uh, dysfunction. So this is really timely. Um, and <clears throat> just to hone in on, on the real hypothesis here is that metformin consumption during five days of bed rest may protect muscle uh, and, and hopefully promote subsequent regrowth seven days after a period of bed rest. Um, so the specific aims all dealt with uh, assessing muscle function, metabolic function, and uh, their associated mechanisms. But uh, what I can highlight in the next slide is the timeline that, that we employed to uh, ask these questions. So um, after we consented these people, and they, uh, these were uh, healthy older people recruited in the Salt Lake area, uh, glucose tolerant people, uh, after we did an uh, informed consent process and blood screening. We did the preliminary assessments, which involved some body composition assessments. Uh, we assessed their muscle function. Uh, they did a muscle biopsy uh, and assessed their metabolic function. So that, that's their, their pre-levels. Then we gave them metformin in, in incrementally increasing doses for two weeks leading up to the period of bed rest. So what this provides us is a picture of what older people's muscle looks like after being given metformin for two weeks. Metformin is only given to people that are pre-diabetic or diabetic, so really nothing is known about uh, what, what metformin can do for healthy older people. So this, this is an interesting window of time for us. I realized that it also, I, we lose some clinical translation here in that if someone was going to be on bed rest because they were injured, they wouldn't know to take metformin two weeks ahead of time. Um, I understand that, but you, you can also think of this research as maybe uh, if someone has a scheduled uh, hip, hip repair or uh, knee repair, they can begin to take this uh, before the procedure, uh, pending the results of this trial, obviously. So then on the first day of bed rest, rest we reassess a lot of the, uh, what we did uh, prior. Then after five days of bed rest, we redo all the measurements again. Uh, and then seven days after recovery, well, after five days, they stopped taking metformin at this point, and then seven days after bed rest, we reassess them again to see if those being given metformin recover faster than uh, others. So unfortunately, at this point, the trial's in its early stage, and I don't have a lot of preliminary data, but um, I can share uh, our, our future research directions. Our, we're pretty sure that we're interested in this time point here, the recovery <laughs> time point, things that you can do to maximize people's recovery, um, really, really delve into what's facilitating the recovery, especially in uh, older, indi older individuals. This is a wide open field. Um, there's a paucity of follow-up research in general in studies like this, um, and usually they're like one year, five year sort of follow-up things, but we think this time point here could be really insightful in, in capturing some of these uh, early regeneration effects. Uh, one particular mechanism that we're interested in studying is the relationship of stem cells to the muscle capillaries in muscle. So uh, it's <clears throat> recently it's been shown that the more capillaries you have in your muscle, the more the, the, you have enhanced metabolic function. That, that makes um, a lot of sense. But also people with more capillaries appear to have greater adaptations to resistance exercise. Um, when we started studying this, I sort of laughed because we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what mechanisms are going on inside the muscle. So I thought it was funny that like, I hadn't really thought that, oh, maybe if you increase the delivery of nutrients and things to help muscle through capillaries, that might be helpful too. Uh, so, that, so it was fun to take a step back and think of it in that way. But um, the, the relationship that I'm highlighting here is how close the capillaries are to the stem cells are as well. So uh, some other research has shown that the closer the capillary, uh, it's difficult to see, but the closer the capillaries are to the stem cells um, to, can predict greater adaptations to exercise and um, enhance muscle health. But uh, there's been very little research done in the context of older people. Um, so 
I think that my research uh, may fall in line very well with a, a few individuals that I've uh, sought out here at the University of Toronto. Um, Dr. Locke here uh, focuses on cellular responses to muscle damage, uh, specifically heat shock proteins. These are um, a cellular response to muscle damage, um, and there's not, not all, there's usually a lot less known about older people's muscle than younger people's muscle. So I. Uh, Really enjoy collaborating with, uh, with him to learn more about how older people might be uh, deficient in these uh, heat shock responses. Dr. Moore um, does a lot of macronutrient manipulation to promote exercise performance. So the idea that you can you can change the food you eat to perform better isn't necessarily new, but in the context of older people, very little is known about what sort of dietary recommendations are best for older people. Um, and they they would also benefit from uh, maximizing and, and promoting their exercise performance as, as well, given that the more active you are and the more muscle you have, the less likely you are to experience periods of inactivity. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Dr. Santamina uh, studies the effects of exercise through the cancer continuum. This area of research is, is completely wide open. Um, very little is known about what people can do uh, to promote their muscle health uh, before they undergo some sort of treatment, uh, radio, either radio or chemotherapy. Um, and the same goes for what they can do during their treatment and, and immediately after. So um, th this could be a very interesting collaboration here. Uh, speaking of fitting into the department, um, I understand I, ha I have some teaching responsibilities, which is uh, a lot of fun. I really, do, uh, I really do enjoy teaching and sharing uh, what I know with other people and communicating it to, the, to other people. Um, my specific research interests include exercise physiology that's really heavily informed by uh, cellular biology and uh, recent research developments. Uh, I think that's really important for people in, to understand what's, what's going on uh, during exercise. Uh, but also, I'm interested in teaching um, a class considering the uh, special populations exercise physiology class. So it, it's sort of funny, special populations are defined as uh, children, women, particularly pregnant women and older people, and the sum of that group is most of the population. So it's funny that um, they're considered special populations, but it's not so funny in that uh, there's very little research uh, regarding uh, these populations. Uh, there's also some uh, really poor uh, exercise consideration advice uh, for these people that uh, need to be addressed and, and taught to taught to people. And, but there are some differential exercise responses amongst these populations that uh, are worth teaching undergraduates. Uh, my teaching experience uh, has been uh, as a master's student at James Madison. I taught two labs in human biomechanics and ex exercise testing and prescription. It was interesting because it was uh, those were heavily uh, heavily emphasized labs, but there were there were some lecture components too um, that I, I really enjoyed as a, a PhD student at the University of Utah. Um, most, most of my time was devoted to research by and large, but I did have a, a, an opportunity to teach a readings and research class to the physical therapy students. Um, and there we met weekly um, for half a semester and discussed the effects that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs might have on skeletal muscle following exercise. Uh, so a lot of people, if they're sore from the uh, amount of exercise, they'll take ibuprofen, but, but we were sort of trying to understand is how this might be interfering with whatever adaptations they were they were seeking to get. Um, also, given that I work in the lab quite a bit, we really love all the health that we get in the lab, and we've really had uh, very impressive undergraduates working in our lab. Um, I've enjoyed uh, teaching them how to perform basic lab techniques. Um, they've, even, they've even got a chance to help design experiments. Uh, they were analyzing data. Um, but uh, one thing I, I really enjoy teaching them our clinical research skills. That seems like a really broad term, but um, it takes it, it, it takes a, a certain kind of person to work at a wet lab, but then also go out and recruit uh, older individuals from the Salt Lake area and um, share your research with them and, and um, explain to them why your research is important. So um, I, I really enjoyed mentoring the undergraduates in our lab and, and teaching them how to, how to interact with real people too. Um, lastly, I. Uh, I'd like to thank my, my lab members, uh, my mentor, Micah. Um, I've really I've really enjoyed my time. I learned so much. Um, uh, additionally, I'd like to thank my dissertation committee and my, uh, the funding sources that made our, our research possible. Um, so 
that's it. Are there any questions that I can? Research experiences with NMEs, mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like if you were just targeting the quad muscle, which is quite large, mm -hmm. have you considered looking at smaller muscles, and maybe that intervention would be effective for other muscles? That are That's smaller? a good question. Um, so we we've approached other physicians uh, at the University of Utah, and, and and trying to figure out where we could implement that that intervention for some of their patients and. We always want to do the quad because it's uh, very involved in, in very powerful motion, like standing up and uh, activities of daily living. But the lower legs uh, appear to atrophy much faster than the uh, sort of upper thigh. So I think it is worth pursuing interventions to protect uh, the muscle in your lower leg, given that it's very involved in balancing and uh, could maybe reduce the risk of falls after uh, a period of bed rest. Um, but another reason we like the quads is because if you can protect bigger groups of muscle, then that muscle is also going to be um, dealing with glucose more. So we're, it, the, the idea is the, the more muscle you can make healthy, the, more, the, the better the metabolic function should be. But I, I certainly agree that there are other muscle groups that are being ignored. Yes? From the physician how do you think one establishes a research pipeline that is at high international level? That is a great question. Um, I think I think you would do that by having your, your research translatable and powerful enough that you could travel to different conferences and meetings and share, share your research in the, the, the broadest uh, audience possible. Uh, the University of Toronto is ranked uh, internationally, and it has, has been so for many years. So uh, I, I imagine uh, the research conducted there gets uh, a, a large audience. And, uh, it's being viewed uh, favorably internationally through conferences and being and published in, in, in as many diverse uh, and wide-ranging journals as possible would be advantageous to the department. Any questions? Yes. Um, you really probably get a simple question, but I'm most interested. What dose of metformin are you looking at too? That's a good question. Um, the dose that uh, clinicians usually start at is two grams per day, and that's what our our patients are getting when they start bed rest. But when they start at one gram per day. So you're starting off like the 500 milligrams twice a day to begin with? Yes. Yeah. And we haven't taken it with meals. Um, and uh, the, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but the number one side effect uh, associated with metformin is gastrointestinal distress. Um, but we and others have found that if you slowly increase the amount that they're taking, then they can tolerate it much better. Um, and in a lot of cases, you'll read that uh, a few subjects reported some gastrointestinal distress, but um, after either reducing the dose or sticking with the dose for a couple days, then those symptoms uh, largely subsided. Thank you. Follow up to the metformin question. I, I was just thinking, you know, you're looking at a population that you're simulating bed rests yes. in your dissertation, right? But they're largely healthy. What is known about the relationship between metformin and a stressed physiologic environment? Is there background knowledge about that? Yeah, so there's, there's actually uh, a contraindication for people to uh, take metformin while they're hospitalized for, for something traumatizing or, or something very serious. Uh, it's thought that taking metformin during this, this severe hospital stay may uh, lead to lactic acidosis, which is a really dangerous condition. Um, it's it's really rare in uh, people that aren't experiencing that, but um, from what we've from what I've learned in, in speaking to some other clinicians at the University of Utah, um, that's that seems to be sort of an invalid um, feeling that that you should uh, tell people to stop taking metformin uh, during that. And in fact, there's one clinician that instead of using insulin to manage people's blood glucose um, during recovery from procedures, uh, she actually has them take metformin. Um, so the, the, it's, it's, it's sort of changing 
um, how, how people look at it. But uh, another way to answer your question is it's very little is known about what metformin could do uh, in, in someone that's very highly inflamed. Um, and coming out shortly. Thank you.